The reading this evening is from Mark chapter 9, beginning at verse 33, and can be found on page 1013. Mark chapter 9, beginning at verse 33. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet, because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child and had him stand among them. Taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Teacher, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop, because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me, for whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. Well, now I'm going to ask you a question. Which of these is the greatest sin? Having multiple affairs, abortion, lying, snorting cocaine, or pride? And I'm not just talking about the sins of the front runner to be our next prime minister. (laughs) But I'm thinking about the last in this series entitled Battles That Christians Face, based on Vaughan Roberts' book by that same title. Let's pray. Our gracious Lord, as we turn to your word, we recognize that we need it desperately as a radical counter to the pressures of society to capitulate to the sinful and selfish values of the world in which we live. So please, will you grant us the stimulation and provocation of the Holy Spirit to be conformed not to this world with all its traps and snares, but rather to the likeness of your Son, the Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, in the book of Proverbs, uh, chapter 6, verse 16, we read, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him, and they are these haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, hearts that devise wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness that breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers and sisters. The thing that God hates and the thing that heads that list the thing we are told that is an abomination to God. I don't think you can get a stronger word than that. What is the thing that is an abomination to God? The thing that God despises more than anything else, haughty eyes. In other words, pride. And so I think we can feel the tension as Jesus enters into that room at Capernaum that we read about in Mark 9, 33. Uh, Jesus talks about the elephant in the room and asks his innocent-faced disciples, what were you discussing in the way? But verse 34 tells us they kept silent. There There was a pregnant pause. For on the way they had been arguing with one another 
about who was the greatest. The followers of Jesus. The disciples of the servant king were fighting over who was more important than the other. No wonder a frosty silence. Of all the disciples of the servant king, which disciple was top dog? It's so ironic, isn't it? And yet so wonderfully honest to read this in Holy Scripture. Jesus doesn't skirt this topic, but addresses the matter and confronts his closest companions over God's number one hate. The thing the book of wisdom, the book of Proverbs calls an abomination, pride. C.S. Lewis, as usual, manages to put his finger on it uh, in chapter one of Mere Christianity. He writes about what he calls the great sin. And this is what he says. There is one vice of which no man in the world is free, which everyone else in the world knows when he sees it in somebody else, and of which hardly any people ever imagine that they are guilty of themselves. That essential vice, this utmost evil, is pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, all that uh, kind of issues that we were thinking about uh, this morning in Colossians chapter 3, he says, are mere flea bites in comparison because it was through pride that the devil became the devil and pride leads to every other vice for it is what Lewis calls the complete anti-God state of mind. What does he mean that it was through pride that the devil became the devil and it's the complete anti-God state of mind? Well, he was referring to a passage in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 14, 12 through to 15, where we learn of Satan's downfall. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer. Um, this is Isaiah 40, 14, verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer. Lucifer, do you know, do you know what the name means? It means bearer of light. Morning star, how you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will ascend to the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And here's the double clue, clue as to the nature of pride. As Mark mentioned this evening, and Beatrice had drawn our attention this morning, it's all about me. It's my, what I do. I will be in charge. It will be me who sits in the throne. I will displace God from his place. And that, of course, has to be why. Of all sins, pride is the mother of all sins because as C.S. Lewis observes it, uh, of every act of rebellion, it is the number one complete anti-God state of mind. And if pride was what Lewis calls the great sin as seen first in Satan... It is also the first great sin to those who succumb to Satan's wiles. It's the first great sin of humankind. It was Jonathan Edwards, the 18th century Puritan, who put it this way. Pride is the worst viper that is in the heart, the great disturber of the soul's peace and sweet communion with Christ. It was the first sin that ever was. And what, of course, he was referring to was when Satan, that great slithery serpent, offered Adam and Eve the forbidden fruit, 
He promised that if they ate it, they would be like God, knowing good and evil. And that was attra- the, the attraction, of course, what Satan offered. Why ought they as human beings content to stay beneath God, taking instructions from him when they could strut around as gods themselves rather than submitting to the great and mighty creator. And so in their pride, they took the first fruit in order to exalt themselves. And in the process, of course, uh, suffered the terrible indignity of experiencing a horrible fall from the dignity of sonship to the dehumanizing depravity of sin, which has been the human lot ever since. Now that really is a thought so deep it could command considerable searching analysis for a very long while. Well, I love the way in our Bible passage from Mark chapter 9, the simple way Jesus instructs his puffed up privileged, proud disciples. What does he do? He does something remarkably simple, yet incredibly profound. He takes a child. The word is actually a little child. He takes an infant. He sets the child in front of them and says to his disciples, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. Now, here we have the disciples and and they're behaving extremely childishly. I'm bigger than you. No, you're not. Yes, I am. And so what does Jesus do? He takes a child, a little boy, a little girl, an infant, and sets her, him in front of the disciples and uses them as a visual aid of how they ought to be. Now, I know that in our day, a boy recently took his father to the European court for smacking him, but in those days, children had no rights, no status, no place in society. Just like slaves They were considered non-people, second-class inferior members of society. And Jesus deliberately chooses one of these non-entities, an infant, and places them in front of his disciples and says, that's how you need to be. No place for haughty eyes. No place for pomposity. No place for a superior attitude. Christ's disciples need to be oblivious to status, importance, greatness, impervious to what other people may think of you. And whichever one of you, he says, wants to be first, she or he must become the very last, the servant of all. Verse 35. Well, so much for the analysis of the problem. What then in the final few moments that we have together is the solution to this first and greatest sin, pride. And for this, I admit, I'm going to draw heavily upon someone who spoke powerfully at the Sing Getty concert at the SSE Arena this past weekend. And here is a very good moment to make available our giveaway book for Father's Day evening. It's John Piper's book entitled, Don't Waste Your Life. Let me quote a little bit from it, page 44. In these pages, I plead with you as a father, perhaps a father who loves you dearly, or the father you never had, or the father you never had a vision, who never had a vision for you like I have for you and God has for you, or the father who has a vision for you, but it's all about money and status. I look through these pages and see you as sons and daughters, and I plead with you, 
desire that your life counts for something great. Long for your life to have eternal significance. Want this. Don't coast through life without a passion. Who would like Don't Waste Your Life by John Piper? There we go. Great. That's your book. And enjoy it. And if anybody else was too shy but would like a copy, I happen to have a second one here as well, also as a free gift. Okay, well, let's uh, draw then heavily upon an article which uh, is easily available on the web entitled Six Ways to Put Away Pride. And I really can't do better than quote uh, John Piper uh, in this, this article. It's interesting, isn't it? I don't know if he, he took this from Proverbs chapter 6, where we're told that there are six things that the Lord hates. We've already quoted from this, but here we have six counter uh, uh, words, how our puffed up, inflated behavior can be pricked. And the first thing he says is this, that in order to, to get rid of this, this first and this great uh, sin of pride, give God the credit. Remember we said that pride puts me on the throne, and that's the essence of haughty eyes, me and my, whereas humility recognizes Christ, who is the one who deserves to be on the throne. In 1 Corinthians 1, the apostle Paul reminds the believers in the city of Corinth that before they became followers of uh, the Lord Jesus, not many of them had been powerful. Um, Not many of them had been wise uh, when God chose them. So he says there, humility says, let those who boast, boast in the Lord. So antidote number one to the danger of pride is to give God the credit for anything that we are and anything that we have. It's sometimes said that uh, a child does well at school because she or he is bright, but if they do badly, it's because they've had a bad teacher. And that, I guess, is the human default attitude towards God as well. Um, But the Christian way is the way of humility, giving God the credit, always. So that's the first great way to uh, prick puffed up pride. It's to uh, give God the credit for all that we have, all that we are. And the second way, says Piper, is to recognize God's gifts. What do you have that you did not receive, asks Paul, In 1 Corinthians 4, humility agrees and is quick to acknowledge that everything we have is a gift from God. Whatever talents we may have, whatever intellectual ability, whatever skills, whatever gifts or looks or pedigree, whatever possessions or influence, pride needs to be put away because every single one of those is a gift from God. And insofar as those have been lent to us, we are to recognize them to be used for God and for his glory. So that's the second thing, recognize God's good gifts. Last night, I've got to tell you, it was wonderful uh, to see how Keith Getty uh, was using his considerable talents, musical, theological, uh, intellectual, for the glory of God in front of 8,000 people. I just love the way so many of you here use the gifts that you have for the benefit of young and old in this congregation and community. And so uh, the second way is to, to recognize that all we have, all we have is pure gift from the Lord. And, and that's a good way to pick uh, a hole in our pride. Thirdly, depend on the providence of God. What is meant by this? Well, in James chapter 4, 
we read these words. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we'll do such a, such a thing. We'll go to this particular town and spend a year there and trade and make profit. You do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you're a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, <clears throat> if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, it is sin. Humility agrees and is glad to say that my heart only beats as long as God chooses. If the Lord wills, we will go home after this service. If the, Lord's, if the Lord wills, we will do this week what is in our diary. If the Lord wills, we will be kept safe in our car and others as they drive towards us. Humility says, God reigns over my heartbeat. God reigns over my brain waves. God reigns over my car and that car. Pride, however, says, I am going to do such a such thing in a town and do business and get gain. We don't want to talk like that. We're to depend on the providence of God. And then fourthly, uh, Piper says, cherish the gospel. This morning, um, Sam was helping us work through Colossians chapter 3. And there we were encouraged to put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. If anybody is a complaint against other, we have to forgive one another as the Lord has forgiven us. So as we ourselves recognize that we are sinners in need of a Savior, utterly dependent on the forgiveness and grace of the Lord Jesus, um, as we recognize that uh, this has only come about by the, by the broken body of Jesus and the cross, that we are only in a right relationship with God because of the healing that comes through the cross, we are able to extend that same transformed attitude towards others as humble, forgiven people so we're to cherish the gospel. The gospel is something to change us every moment of every day, not just at some particular moment in ancient history. Fifthly, serve others. And what I think must really have shaken up the disciples as Jesus uh, asked um, uh, them that loaded question, what were you talking about uh, as we walked here? was that they knew Christ wasn't asking anything of them that he had not already demonstrated to them. The way of humility, the way of servanthood, the way of washing feet. Uh, remember our Bible passage we read from Mark, insomuch as you give a cup of water to someone in need, you're doing it in Jesus' name. And if anybody deserved honor and recognition and respect, it was Jesus. And yet, as Philippians 2 reminds us, the Lord Jesus, although equal with God, did not grasp onto that, but rather emptied himself, took the form of a servant, humbling himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. And that means getting down low in order to lift others up. It doesn't mean standing in status, but kneeling in service. Because the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And since we have a savior like that, who went all the way to the cross, this is the pattern for those who would follow him. It is a most effective antidote to our foolish pride. Humility measures everything, not by how it will enhance my reputation, but how it will serve the good of others. Six, thing, six things that God hates? Well, here's the sixth and final antidote uh, to pride, and it is this. No true greatness. Sitting down, Jesus called the 12 disciples and said, if anybody wants to be first, 
Mark chapter 9, verse 35, he must be the very last and the servant of all. And he took a little child and had him stand among them. And then taking him up in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little ones in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. And then in Mark chapter 10, who would be great among you? You must be their servant. Whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. This is the upside down kingdom, isn't it? We're just like a helpless and dependent little child. We are happy and safe in daddy's arms from the security of the father's embrace. The child doesn't say, look how smart I am finding myself here. The child is resting because all that they are, all that they have is in the goodness and the grace of a loving father God. So humility and and servanthood is the way to true greatness. Six ways then to go low. Give God the credit, recognize God's gifts, depend on the providence of God. Cherish the gospel, serve others, and know that true greatness is the way of humility and servanthood. This is the last in our wee series on battles Christians face, and uh, it has simulated our thinking and in that book which is available at the bookstall Vaughan Roberts tells a story about a man kneeling at a soldier's grave near Nashville after the American Civil War a passerby noticed this man's posture and asked him if his son was buried there no he replied My family was sick when I was called to fight and they depended upon me. And so a friend who was unmarried volunteered to take my place. He was wounded at uh, uh, Chickamauga and was carried to the hospital here where he died. I have traveled many miles so I can write on his grave. He died for me. So C.S. Lewis was right then to call pride the first and the great sin. It corrupts our relationship with God and with other people. And as we recognize that satanic poison within our hearts, so we also then need to apply the antidote, which is none other and the cross of Christ, not only as the means of forgiveness for our pride, but also as a model of a totally different way of living, the path of humility and the way of servanthood. Shall we pray? And as we do so, perhaps we can use the words of Isaac Watts. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my Lord, all the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. And what we pray is in the name and for the sake of Jesus. The grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.